coming up on Dialogue Weekend. China and U.S. agree phase one trade deal. Will there be more breakthroughs in the trade war? Boris Johnson gets early U.K. Christmas present. Get Brexit done. How will he get Brexit done in one month? And in Silicon Valley, more Indian origin CEOs are running global technology giants. What's different in Indian education? Now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qianzhuo. Here with me in the studio are Wang Dan and Wang Huiyao. Welcome to both of you. Well, first thing first, uh, finally we have the mini deal or the phase one deal between China and the United States. So less tariffs and more trade. Certainly this is the most positive story uh, for a long time actually in the world. You can see the welcome expressed by the markets around the globe. So for you, obviously the right move in the right direction. I agree with you. I think this is a landmark uh, agreement that has been after almost 20 months of uh, dispute and uh, you know, friction or trade war. Now we finally settle something. I think it's really a great uh, Christmas gift <laughs> from both countries. For both countries, for the world. Yeah, actually. for the world as well. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think this is, uh, even though it's a phase one, but it's still quite uh, substantial. And then, for example, it has covered uh, quite a number of areas. You know, like uh, uh, you know, technology transfer, intellectual property protection, and also you have uh, financial market, you have agriculture, you have expanded trade, and you have a uh, dispute resolution. So, so it's quite a wide range. But I think it's most is that it gave a new impetus to the to the confidence of of, of both countries, particularly in the business uh, community. But also it paves the way for the I think for the phase two or even phase three discussion. So it's it's long overdue. I think this uh, this trade agreement and then. Uh, I'm glad that uh, even though uh, Chinese uh, officials hold a, a conference uh, last night at 11 p.m., whereas uh, President Trump tittered uh, th uh, this morning, <laughs> uh, he also uh, you know, claimed this is a great deal. So I think it's important that both sides you know, sit down, talk, dialogue is the, is the solution, rather than you know, uh, uh, discredit and also not, not really talking and settle the, the dispute. So finally, through dialogue and discussion, however long, um, well, right. it, it proves to be productive. Well, in a way it is, but I'm a bit more pessimistic than uh, Mr. Wang. Because for me, uh, this is, first of all, very uplifting. Uh, we have seen very positive response from the stock market, especially for Trump. This is a win. And that's partly why I think the conference was held at 11 p.m. That coincides mm -hmm. with the market opening time in the mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. and stock market rallied afterwards. And this is very good news for Trump. But for China, I don't think this is necessarily a good news because this is a very shallow deal. So the only concrete thing we know is about agricultural purchase. And if, that, if this can be done, China actually is making a lot of compromises since it's not in urgent need to purchase all those goods. Uh, and for phase two and phase three, it just looks like there's not much we can tackle um, because IP protection is just a lot of challenges. No, I, I, I disagree. I, I think that uh, you know, this has actually uh, covered uh, eight or nine topic area that uh, mm -hmm. has been all on the table. At least yeah. people are starting to talk about and also uh, trying to get some solution out of that. Most mm -hmm. important, it, it stops the downward spiral of this negative sentiment and uh, you know, the, uh, the, mm -hmm. the uh, aggressiveness of, of each side. I think this really now at least pr provides a stabilizer mm -hmm. and, th and then you know, pave the way for the future. So, so I think we need something like this for, for quite some time. And uh, it's either U.S. or China that really can't afford to drag on too much. I, yeah, I tend to agree with uh, you. I think it mm. provides uh, you know, at least uh, some certainty because mm. over the past like 18 months, it's ups and downs, <laughs> right? It's a ro roller coaster. Right, right, right. Uh, sometimes you have a uh, high expectation and then it falls uh, into uh, really the low point and then you have mm. expectation again. But finally, we say there is a phase one deal of course, mm. it's to be signed the next month. There are still some details and the legal issues, review, etc. Mm. Uh, but at least I think it provides this foundation for the both sides that we can work together. We can work out a deal. Mm. Uh, we call it a mini deal, or phase right. one deal. Very small. <laughs> um, it's, it's small. It still contains uh, you know, uh, multiple aspects. I think it somehow laid the foundation well, I think it's, for the discussion. It's, it's very important mm -hmm. that on De December 15, you know, USA is not going to escalate uh, uh, the tariff again, mm -hmm. and, also mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and also they're going to re re roll back some of that tariff. 
But you know, there is the contingency terms, though. If uh, there's any issue with the enforcement, uh, because there is the snap, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. snap clause on that. So if there's anything that China fails to deliver, then the tariffs can come back. Well, that, that, that's, uh, you know, that's U.S. can do it anyway. I mean, right. uh, uh, so, so I, I think the, uh, President Trump was, was really insist not rolling back mm -hmm. anything. As I said, in the, in the, we, I just come back from U.S. with the uh, former trade minister, and uh, mm -hmm. we said there is that, uh, you know, if China has already agreed uh, to, to quite a big uh, the purchase, a lot of uh, area to, to liberalize, for example, financial market, be opened mm -hmm. uh, on, on January 1st of the next year. So a lot of things has been rolling out, new foreign investment law, uh, but the U.S. has to roll back, you know, in order to really show this true respect for, mm. for equality and mutual respect. So I think this reflects that. The president does roll back some of that. And also, I think mm. you know, if you look at the Chinese uh, uh, side, the Israel says offers, for example, the purchase mm. of agricultural products, including pork, let's say, mm -hmm. well, which is what we need anyway. Yeah, we need pork. <laughs> it's, where, <laughs> it's, it's really yeah. about where you purchase from okay. Brazil, uh, Russia, or the United or States, Canada, or Canada. Yeah. Uh, and then, if you look at the other aspects, for example, IPR production, I think this is exactly what we need to do, do a better job. Absolutely. Yes, we have been working very hard on that, but you have to acknowledge this is a large country. This yeah. is, you know, country know. One, one, 1 billion people. One concern I have is that whether the U.S. will have the patience. Uh, you know, China has laid out all those measures mm -hmm. to open up the domestic market. Mm -hmm. But if the U.S. wanted to speed up, I don't know if we have the tolerance for that. Because if you look at the most recent policy development, like the Central Economic Conference, which mm -hmm. just ended yesterday, um, there are a lot of talks on still industrial policy, on the state-owned enterprises will lead the way. And these are exactly the areas that the U.S. want China to reform. But China cannot afford to accelerate yeah, it. I, 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 I seem to have a different view. I think yesterday, you know, when they had a news conference, several ministers uh, was talking, uh, Mr. Liao, Minister Liao and Mr. Wang, yeah, and, and, yeah, minister, also yeah. they are talking. Exactly, you know, the tune of that is actually, we, we are not open for the U.S. It's right. actually for China to accelerate its reform. China IPR needs to be protected for the Chinese companies. And then also we actually we need more opening up of financial sectors. So foreign mm -hmm. banks comes in, our, our small and medium enterprises can get access to the loans and uh, have more competition. So, mm -hmm. so I think if we regard it as uh, we are all losing to the U.S., as, I think it's not, not a right as assessment. It's actually for the Chinese good, for China to open up and really to be more uh, open. Uh, you know, as far as... Uh, as OE is con uh, reform is concerned, I mean, right. this is certainly going to help on that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if more companies, if, for example, the financial sector open right. for foreign banks yeah. comes in, you will be opposed uh, in, uh, in immediate competition with the SOE banks. So that is a good, good sign. So I, I think it's a good direction. That is, if we assume we f if we have a more free flow of capital, which cannot mm -hmm. happen very soon. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, you have to start somewhere, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, Wanda has a point, of course. I mean, uh, mm. uh, obviously, all those measures are in line with China's own goal of yeah. deepening mm. reform and right. opening further to the outside world. But right. then, uh, even for Chinese companies, Chinese mm. market, Chinese economy, uh, we cannot afford to drag on on some mm -hmm. of the necessary reforms. We have to do it. We have to do it in an effective and efficient manner. Mm -hmm. Not for the U.S., not for the Americans, uh, not for overseas companies, but also for the sake of our own uh, good. Absolutely. So we I have to do that. I, yeah. I think the most important, uh, after all, I mean, this is a, a, a strong injection into the confidence boosting mm -hmm. of both countries because it's so negative on both sides and we, we need some good news. So hopefully mm -hmm. we build on some good sentiment and let's have a good Christmas, New Year, and let's work on continuously for the remaining uh, issues. Yeah. Uh, you know, speaking <laughs> of that, but also remember, you know, for the U.S., there's also the view that, uh, you know, for President Trump and his administration, obviously, he's somehow like running out of ammunition. And you know, for the last batch of uh, basically the you know, consumer durable, it's probably mm -hmm. very difficult to, to, for the consumers to accept, especially right, right before Christmas. Right, exactly. And also, agriculture, uh, you know, state in the United States, you can see the survey, the opinion polls now is coming down. Mm -hmm. People are suffering, especially the farmers, right? Right. So Trump needs a win, and yeah. he wants to win the next coming election. Um, but for China, I think there's a real risk after 2020 if Trump becomes a new president or if Joe Biden or Elizabeth mm -hmm. Warren, whoever becomes the new president, they won't go easy on China. We might see a renegotiation of the current deal. Mm -hmm. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, look, I, I do think the U.S. also need to do badly because President Trump is facing the impeachment, <laughs> which is going on. <laughs> and then also uh, U.S. farmers hurt him badly. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also the U.S. economy, I think, you know, gradually will be dragged into this kind of a, uh, a trade war and, uh, inf you know, impact. And I think also uh, the whole world would, would really not tolerate 
This that, is too long. That's yeah. right. You know, if you look at uh, the uh, trade war, as we mm -hmm. said, uh, basically it benefits nobody. You know, no, no sides can mm -hmm. claim there's a victory for us. Uh, yes, Chinese economy is being affected, but look at mm -hmm. the U.S. The investment is low. Why? Because people, it's not there's a lack of uh, uh, liquidity. Mm -hmm. It's because people lack this confidence, lack mm -hmm. the confidence in the certainty of the future. So they are not sure like where to invest, how much they're going to invest. So that is a fact in the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. So they have to do something too. As we, you know, the Chinese side always stressed that, you know, you have to solve the problem through dialogue. And if you launch the trade war, remember, the mm -hmm. trade war is launched, was launched by the United States, not by the Chinese side. Right. And uh, this is not, not the right approach to solve the trade dispute, to so, solve this problem. So eventually it's up to the U.S. whether they want to give up on this trade war. But to me, I still think that's a big uncertainty right there. On the competition between U.S. and China, we can see in technology and financing everything, even in overseas investment. So for both sides, for either side to change or reverse their position, it will be extremely difficult. So I'm not, not too, pa too optimistic <laughs> about a bilateral relation. Yeah. Yeah. With, with, with yeah. that, uh, you know, of course, like uh, we say the U.S. I mean, China relationship is a very complicated, especially right. today. Mm -hmm. um, both nations have their, uh, you know, their concern and um, big powers around the world. So, mm -hmm. but at least we say this phase one trade deal has created some certainty. We'll speak of uh, certainty you know, falling on that theme. Let's take a look at the elections in the UK where the Conservative Party has secured a landslide victory which certainly uh, makes the Brexit uh, much more certain. And of course, uh, uh, the, the Conservative Party sort of like out of expectation, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, has won this decisive victory. <laughs> and people would say, yeah, uh, let's wait until the end of January. Uh, UK will say uh, bye to the EU. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, it's becoming true. Yeah, I mean, the British voters must be like, phew, three and five, uh, 3.5 years of negotiation. Finally. And finally, it's done. But I wonder if sometime there will be a wake-up call to the British voters, what they have been voted for. Um, because for Boris Johnson, his entire marketing strategy is that he is the guy who can get Brexit done. And that's his entire slogan. Simple, narrow-minded, get it done. Uh, and for sure, by the end of January, he can get it done. Uh, the Britain will leave the EU uh, with a certainty. But that's the end of Act 1. It's not the end of the whole game. After that, the Britain will have to get into this new round of negotiation with the European Union on a permanent trade agreement. If Boris Johnson doesn't get this done by the end of 2020, then that's a whole uncharted territory. Then the future of Britain will be even more uncertain. Yeah. Well, I, I think that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, this election shows that people are really fed up of this uh, uncertainty. And then and after three years of all those ugly, uh, you know, in and out and all those uh, votes and, and, and turned down and, uh, so many times by the Parliament of the UK. But I think, you know, it does provide some certainty for the UK. So I, I think the, the act, the act that will, will, will take place as, as Bruce Johnson promised. But also it presents new opportunities and challenges ahead. I mean, opportunities means that the UK now can write a new chapter with the EU, but also can expand cooperation with other countries like China. Or U.S. like uh, President Trump more sovereignty said. back, uh, and, and and then on the other hand, you probably will have a new player now on the multilateral field in the international arena, and the U.K. you know being at uh, uh, so uh, slow you know smaller than the U.S. now still has a lot of soft power and on mm -hmm. the globalization front. So so I think that uh, uh, it probably presents a huge opportunity for China to work well with with U.K. and then maybe on the Belt and Road Initiative. You know, then, and then also, uh, uh, and then it can, it can be a go-between mm -hmm. of the China, U.S., China, EU, and then, you know, even U.K. applied for, uh, joined the CPTPP. So you, you, you don't ask the, ask the man that. So uh, uh, Theresa May's go, go, uh, go, 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 Britain, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It, it really uh, is going to happen, I think. Uh, yes, uh, you know, there's, if you look at the prospect, which mm. is almost limitless, but, um, you know, with Brexit, it creates a lot of problems. I agree with you, not mm -hmm. only with the EU, but also within Britain. <laughs> uh, within the UK, you see uh, the Scotland, uh, the uh, Scottish mm -hmm. National, uh, National Party, SNP, uh, so obviously they won uh, also a landslide victory in Scotland right. and then they got a strong mandate. Mm -hmm. That means like, uh, okay, um, well now Boris Johnson has the fate of the UK in his hand. 
Mm -hmm. Now we should have our own fate in our hand. That means like a second referendum on independence of Scotland. Right, exactly. That's the new uncertainty introduced uh, with the election of Boris Johnson. Um, because for me, I actually think the Labour Party would be more suitable to rule the country if we don't think about Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> I, I personally don't like him. It's a, a bit crazy. Um, but uh, they talk about real issues, so health care reform, education. That's why they lost. That's exactly why they <laughs> lost, because that's not on people's mind. People mm. want to get Brexit done. Right, right. But then uh, the, the political landscape will change as well with this election. You know, some of the remainers even vote for uh, the Conservative. Some of the previous Labour Party members, uh, their voters mm -hmm. have voted for conservative and that's not the case since what since the 80s when uh, Mrs. Thatcher Quite was in position ago, yeah. it's a long time ago mm -hmm. I, I really think this election reflect the certainty prevail certainty will because Labour Party said if, he, if they win they're going to have another referendum <laughs> that's really going to scare a lot of people they don't want to go right. through the, the maze again you know mass again and mm -hmm. then have, uh, mm -hmm. you know have this up, up down feelings and, and uncertainty so I think uncertainty is the word most needed being Britain, being the US, being China, everyone. We need a certainty, at least uh, some expectation, expectation, not uncertainty. That would be the biggest uh, risk. The only risk is like uh, the certainty is a bit short lived right, <laughs> like right. for next month. But mm. after that, obviously, you know, the EU side has expressed the concern, you know, like 11 months left, mm -hmm. being left after Brexit. Is that possible to reach a comprehensive deal, basically, that mm -hmm. will reshape the relationship between the UK and the European Union? Mm -hmm. Obviously, not easy. Now, after that, I think the UK will start the negotiation with the United States. Mm -hmm. Remember who they are deal, uh, dealing with. That's Trump. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Trump is going to touch upon something very sensitive, like the NHS. Yes, totally. Uh, and also on uh, the foreign trade investment and also on Huawei issue because UK is sort of on the side to, in a way, supporting Huawei mm -hmm. and I don't think US is okay with that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, uh, you know, really Bruce Johnson have this huge mandate and then they are, they are majority in 30 years time for, for conservatives. So they will actually have a much strong hand. In that's terms of dealing uh, with the EU and the uh, US and, and the rest of the world. As the one then said, that's Act 1. We will follow mm -hmm. uh, probably the next act and after that. Uh, but let's uh, jump to a different topic. Uh, you know, if you are following this corporate news, uh, Alphabet, the parent company of Google, is having a new CEO, uh, Sander Pichai. Uh, Sander Pichai joins this long list of Indians as top CEOs of global company. So some say India is the country that exports the most number of CEOs. So what's the secret? And uh, how much does that have to do with their education? I don't want that you just to be back from India and you paid special attention to the education in India. What's the secret? <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I always fascinated with India and this year it's the first time I went there. Uh, and for India and China, we often like to compare them because they both are uh, countries with large size of economy, a long history, old civilization, um, but they take very different paths. So for China, it has marketed itself as the manufacturing center of the world, but India answers the call. They're the back office of the world. And China, uh, consistent with that, has put a lot of focus on public education, but India exclusively, almost to me, on elite education. But publicly, they don't spend enough resources. So I went to the rural area. Uh, the, the number I got is 60% of the rural population are still illiterate in India right now. And that's Six, unthinkable. 63? 60. 60. Right, right. That's unthinkable for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. um, and after uh, Modi got into position as prime minister, he made a lot of reforms, good ones, but also he increased a lot of welfare spending while decreasing the development spending, including education. And that's not a good sign. But one good thing I noticed in India's education is that they do encourage debate and freedom of thinking. And that's basically behind uh, this rise of Indian CEOs globally. Uh, they can talk, uh, they know how to communicate, and that's exactly something that Chinese lack. Yeah. Well, uh, I, 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 I agree with some of that, but uh, India is a really fascinating country. I, I, this mm -hmm. year I've been touched to India. And for the last mm -hmm. five years I've been invited to speak at India on many occasions. What I found is that a very, very interesting comparison. You know, 80, in the 1980s, India and China were, were similar level. Now mm -hmm. China is five times uh, larger than, than GDP in India. And then, you know, uh, I think India uh, have a lot of elite uh, talent because mm -hmm. of its education system, elite education, but particularly of the English advantage mm -hmm. that they have. That's, I think, that's the strongest uh, thing they have. So if, if China can really strengthen more on the English education, <laughs> 
if all universities can open <laughs> undergraduate courses in English, yeah. I think it will greatly en enhance the Chinese competitiveness on the global market for the talent. Second, mm -hmm. I think that uh, you know, uh, India infrastructure-wise is, is, is not uh, up to date. It's, it's really hugely behind. So that's why you see Chinese companies like Xiaomi and, uh, and all those companies uh, you know, uh, doing so well in India. Mm. It's because I think infrastructure-wise, there's, there's Chinese are really great uh, in terms of providing the service. But, but India does offer something for Chinese to learn. The service sector is really uh, doing pretty well. And I think you know, in terms of uh, government models, China and India, you know, the land of China is you know, publicly owned. But then you see so much infrastructure can be taken place. Well, India is private only. It's difficult. So, yeah. And also there's a religion. There's a lot of things. Right, yeah. right. India is more divided than EU. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Between <laughs> states, they have to pay Between trade tariffs. That's right. right. So, right. So, so you really yeah. can't see how which, which is doing better. But I think in the long run, China and India are so complementary. Those are the largest populous world countries in the world. Uh, have 2.6 billion altogether. It's mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity for Chinese company and Indian company together. Yeah, very different the system, uh, obviously. But I think you know uh, the overall investment of the government in education, either in this higher institution or mm -hmm. the primary education, and um, long term speaking, will be important to the country's long term development. Here I have some uh, numbers, like uh, you know the share of the union budget allocated to education actually fell uh, from uh, say about 4.1 percent in the period uh, of 2014 to 15 mm. to 3.4 percent in 2019 uh, to 2020. So the period during which the BJP, the ruling party, actually headed the government. That's mm. according to the latest uh, uh, government documents. Mm. So that shows like if you are having a sliding investment in education, mm. uh, I would say in general, uh, it's, it's, it's I mean, less positive, let's say. Oh, it's much less positive mm -hmm. because fiscal resources and the government spending are key to improve education. And that's why when, we, when I see the news, uh, for example, Foxconn moving its factory to India, mm -hmm. uh, Samsung moving its factory to India, I know it cannot be large scale, I know it cannot be long lasting. Because for India, they don't have enough labor, really, to support this level of manufacturing. The value chain is not there either. Supply the value chain is not there either. You mean also skilled labor, too. The skilled labor. Right. They're all the very low skilled or mm -hmm. very high skilled. At least they should be literate, let's say. Yeah, at least uh, that. You can right. read, you can be trained to become a skilled worker over there. Right, right, exactly. The potential of India is enormous. I think it's particularly complementary well with China. And then the two countries should really work together. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and then I mean, India has its strength, China has its own strength. Yeah. Uh, we should work together. If you look at the potential of the market, it's uh, huge. Mm -hmm. It's really about uh, how to unleash the potential. Now mm -hmm. we are talking about the aspect of education, you mm -hmm. know, from uh, the, the perspective of education, how we can do a better right. job actually to unleash the potential. And India obviously is doing very well in terms of elite, uh, elite education. We should, we should learn from India on the education and then more English learning from India. Uh, India should learn China on more infrastructure and more government investment on the infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And one thing I think Indian people are really good at is, uh, uh, this is another strength, uh, making allies uh, mm -hmm. and do collaborative work. This is my favorite economist, Amadiya Sen, he's also from India. Uh, and uh, him and uh, his fellow uh, Indian economists, they do a lot more collaborative wor uh, working papers with each other. If you look at Chinese scholars, that's not the case. Yeah. Well, the I hope India is not pulling out of RCEP, you know, because <laughs> we really need India. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, that's something yeah. Yeah. Uh, we need to learn. Uh, obviously, we need to learn from each other, uh, not only yeah. between China and India, but also China, US, China, Europeans, yeah. China with uh, Russia, right. Brazil, every country, actually. There's something to learn for us. Uh, well, with that, uh, let's leave it there uh, and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. Following, um, you know, the social media closely, Li Ziqi, uh, either on YouTube or on, on Weibo here mm -hmm. in China, and probably people are familiar with this uh, young lady. Mm -hmm. Basically, she's doing documentary, uh, documenting her life as a, say, farmer, 
mm -hmm. in a part of China, I would say southern, probably uh, southwestern part of China. Yeah. So not all China, because China is so large, <laughs> not everywhere is like that. But there's a, you know, her life is being depicted in a very beautiful, beautiful way. Mm -hmm. uh, we know, you know, working as a farmer, actually, you will face a lot of challenges. Right. But uh, of course, this is, uh, uh, you know, my maid, let's say, uh, for mm -hmm. people to see. Uh, but then, interesting, there's a debate about, you know, whether this is uh, uh, conducive or not uh, to the export of culture. I'm, I feel uncomfortable with the export of culture. Mm -hmm. I would say to introduce Chinese culture uh, mm -hmm. to people from uh, other countries, probably. Uh, I don't see it that way. Uh, I do see the debate online saying this, this might, uh, there might be some political power behind it. But to me, I liked Li Ziqi a long time ago, before she was even so hot now, oh, on really? this level now. But she's an amazing cook. Mm -hmm. Like, you look at the stuff she makes, you, uh, you feel happy. Mm -hmm. And also, she kind of brings out this nos uh, nostalgia feeling, mm -hmm. as she made things from scratch. Uh, and I spent a few years when I was little with my grandma in the countryside, and she made things from scratch. Mm -hmm. So the way she did it, al although I know it's a lot more beautiful, it's probably filmed in a different way, but it has brought back good memories. I know myself, I can never leave the big cities anymore because I need this urban life, but I would love to see someone recording it like she does, mm -hmm. in a very delicate, neat way, and I enjoy that. I think this is really a new phenomenon of, of individual globalization that is going on, that the individual power and the impact, particularly of the culture, but also reflect the human being's nature, and which is fundamentally universal. You know, you know, it's kind of a, you know, all the, the, the things that we've been doing from the childhood, to from the rural, from, from urban, and then from the, you know, what's going on in, the, in this globalization. One thing I do want to point out is that, of course, he's popular in China already, but then using the YouTube, she's got famous uh, in the world now, I even have more followers than CNN, for mm -hmm. example. But that's exactly the point. You know, China does not lack in talents. You know, we should probably open the YouTube, <laughs> tutors, and even you know this kind of a international social media to really exemplify the Chinese uh, culture power or maybe mm -hmm. influence. Yeah. So so that mm -hmm. uh, you know, on President Trump's Twitter, it was only. Uh, his U.S. fans was was a prison. <laughs> there was no Chinese critic on that. So, so maybe open uh, this kind of uh, social media would really export or maybe have uh, uh, more, uh, you know, bring out more Chinese uh, soft power and influence, yeah. which is reflect human beings' nature and universal culture. On I agree with you on the sense, uh, in the sense that you know, individual globalization. Mm. Uh, basically, the human beings we are common. We enjoy this commonality. Actually, right. you know, wherever you live around this global, uh, mm. we all have similar experience or similar feelings basically right, right. you know the way or uh, the life uh, depicted in this uh, uh, you know, videos always mm -hmm. yeah, you use the word like nostalgia mm -hmm. uh, because you know uh, industrialization most of the countries in particular developed countries live right. in the process of post industrialization exactly. so before that agriculture civilization. Mm -hmm. We all plant the seed you know, from the very start and then you water the seed and then grow up and then you harvest it and then you, uh, uh, you know, uh, do a process and you know, make uh, uh, other products, uh, exactly. food out of that. So mm -hmm. that somehow reflects something we all been passing or experiencing. Right, right. So it makes me feel, uh, of course, uh, nostalgic and feel uh, somehow so close. Exactly. Now we're basically just all victims of consumerism. Mm -hmm. And when you look at Lisa, she, she barely talks in her video. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know how rare that is in today's online world? Mm -hmm. And just by looking at her, I do feel more relaxed, although this might be a facade of what real life is. And I've also heard people criticizing uh, this might be something novelty to foreigners. Foreigner like that because they have this image of a Chinese woman that should be like that. But we, we well, there's well, more, well, more variety in China. I know she'll have many channels to Unfortunately, to we are running out of time. With that, we are coming to the end of today's show. You can watch us on the CDT app or on the YouTube. I'm Xu Qianduo. You can follow me on Twitter, Xu Qianduo. Thank you for watching. See you next week. <laughs>